Welcome to the Practice of Medicine podcast from the Southern Medical Association. Since 1906, the SMA has had a singular mission to provide medical professionals with the resources they need to learn from each other and in so doing to improve the overall quality of patient care. The Practice of Medicine podcast is just one of the ways we do that as we discuss a wide range of topics, including the Physicians in Training Day in the Life podcast series. To learn more about the SMA's many other services and educational initiatives, please visit us at sma.org. In this introduction to a multi-part podcast series, Dr. Benjamin Broom, a nephrologist with Nephrology Associates in Birmingham, Alabama, is joined by Drs. Elizabeth Edwards and Donald DePetty, both of whom are on faculty in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of South Carolina in Columbia. They will offer healthcare providers an overview of conditions that can warrant a nephrology referral, as well as provide insight into collaboration among providers when referring a patient. Thank you for being here today. Wonderful. Glad to be here. Renal disease affects 15% of the U.S. adult population and is considered the under-recognized health crisis with significant morbidity and mortality. Could you share with our listeners some of the most common conditions and issues encountered by healthcare providers that can lead to a nephrology referral or consultation? Yeah, certainly. I I would agree that that I think Kidney disease and chronic kidney disease in uh, in general is is often overlooked, especially in early stages. Um, uh, obviously, you know any primary care physician, it's something that's on their mind, but often doesn't get uh, any significant attention until it's to a point where it, it's if not extreme, you know maybe past the point of of really something that we can intervene on. The most common consultation I get is is a patient who's really to any age, but often past the age of 50, they've got underlying comorbidities that are often, that we see very often, including high blood pressure, diabetes, and then as as their primary care physician is checking yearly or bi-yearly labs, suddenly see that a creatinine is up for, for some reason, either slightly up or extremely up or anywhere in between, and it's it's then at that point that a consultation is placed and referral made to myself or you know someone like me. I would say that the most important thing from a primary care point of view is, is to understand and really you know keep in mind that kidney issues or evidence of kidney issues really should be thought of in two baskets, acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease. You know, is this uh, um, a patient you've been following for decades and you're following their labs closely and you've never noticed that they've had issues with their kidneys before, that their labs have been abnormal and and now that you are? Or is this a patient that, you know, has been having some evidence of renal renal insufficiency for years and has just slowly progressed or or rapidly progressed or anywhere in between? You know, it's the best way to, at least in my mind, start that thought process of, you know, what is going on? Is, is this something I need to be highly, highly concerned about? Is this something that I'm, you know, kind of expecting? Something I think I can at least watch or manage to some degree or something that I really need some help or assistance with? Ben, you mentioned some conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, uh, et cetera, that, that lead uh, to renal disease or, or kidney disease. Is, is it important that we, that we look at these, in, these states individually? Uh, or most often they occur in clusters uh, in the individual patient. Is that something of greater concern? Uh, I don't know if I'd say it's of greater concern. I'd absolutely agree with you that it seems, you know, nine times out of a, out of 10 um, that the patients that get referred to me uh, have both high blood pressure and diabetes, especially in, in the South and this part of the country where I am. I mean, those just go hand in hand. You, you know, it, it is almost impossible to find one without the other. Um, you know, sometimes I get a younger patient without diabetes who has just, you know, malignant high blood pressure has for a long time, either went unnoticed or, or not properly managed or, or efficiently managed. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know if I've ever seen someone who comes in with diabetes with also, without also uh, high blood pressure, uh, maybe more so the other way around. High blood pressure and diabetes are absolutely the number one and two causes of, of kidney disease in this country. 
both of those disease processes are hard on blood vessels. And at the end of the day, the kidneys are little more than bags of blood vessels. So, you know, high blood pressure plus diabetes plus time equals scarring and injury to the kidney, which eventually will, will be reflected by changes in their lab work. But let me let me follow that up a little bit more, Ben. Since these all cluster, hypertension, diabetes, hypolipidemia, and they are, like you said, they're the most common causes of renal insufficiency and, and chronic renal failure. But oftentimes we already we just assume that somebody with hypertension and diabetes, their renal disease or elevated creatinine is due to one or the other or both. But is that a, is that a false assumption? Uh, there, are there individuals that can have a totally unrelated uh, etiology of their renal disease despite having these you know, common comorbidities? And, and if so, how would we know? Yeah, no, it's a, a very fair question. Um, I would say absolutely there are other causes of, of renal disease outside of those two that can be uh, occurring or, or that develop in patients that have both of those. And so it can be almost impossible to tell. You know, I would, part of it is unfortunately experience to some degree, right? I mean, you know, we, we all follow these patients that we expect. We're not super surprised if, you know, their, their GFR is declining over time and these sorts of things. You know, I would say, obviously, two things uh, to, to really that should catch your eye is, is if, you know, their creatinine is rising at a rate that you feel that in your experience seems, you know, a little fast, right? You know, compared to patients you see in the past. Obviously, doing things like monitoring urine and specifically uh, proteinuria or the amount of protein in the urine is, is another, you know, good indication of does this feel kind of like the natural progression of, of what I think is going on or, or are they going from, you know, absent proteinuria to several grams in a, in a relatively short period of time. Now, things like that can happen just because of high blood pressure and diabetes, but you know, those would be some cases where I go, well, you know, give me a second. This, I've been doing this for a while. And even if you haven't been doing this for a while, you know, I, I think I know how this should progress. And it, it, it seems, it seems a little out of ordinary that this, that I'm, you know, I'm seeing these things you know, trend in, in this fashion. Um, you know, I, the, as far as patients who don't have high blood pressure and diabetes or hyperlipidemia or these, you know, chronic conditions that, that we're expecting, those cases seem a bit easier, right? You know, you've got an otherwise relatively healthy person that, that doesn't have these issues and their creatinine is up a, a point or two for no, un, you know, inexplicable reason. Um, or they're coming in and they're otherwise young and healthy and they've got a lot of protein and they've got a lot of blood in their urine. You know, these things, obviously, those are the easy cases, right? Those are the ones that, yeah, uh, I don't feel comfortable something's going on. It's the ones that are kind of in between where you have good reason, but maybe feel uncomfortable or a little uneasy with the, the rate of progression or the slope of the trends, I guess I could say. Uh, ben, since this is our, our kickoff podcast uh, to a series that's going to get much more specific, can you give us an overview on considerations that the provider, the whether it's a primary care uh, provider or even a, a specialist uh, uh, seeing these patients should be concerned about regarding racial differences or ethnic, ethnic uh, differences, et cetera, in the presentation of these common renal diseases? I would say that, that across the board, it does seem that, you know, our, our African-American, our Hispanic population do have a higher prevalence of kidney disease. And, and does that track with their, you know, also a higher prevalence of high blood pressure and diabetes to some degree, but also not, you know, I wouldn't say that I would look at or treat or refer based on, on racial differences. Okay. You know, I wouldn't say, oh, well, this African-American patient, you know, I would expect them to progress faster. So this is, this is more expected for them versus uh, a non-African-American population. But yeah, as far as the overall prevalence of chronic kidney disease and, and ultimately end-stage renal disease, African-American population uh, ha does have, unfortunately, a, a much higher rate. Thank you very much, Ben. Yep. I have, a, I have a quick question, Ben. 
throughout the years, I've always heard that nephrologists uh, would prefer early rather than late uh, referral. Uh, we know that early referral does reduce uh, or at least slow progression of CKD, but all too often in primary care, we have these, you know, people who come in and just there's this slow, gradual, steady kind of stepwise decline in GFR. And there's no single point at which it's obvious that, oh my goodness, I got to get nephrology involved. And I think a lot I don't know a lot of us, I know I suffer maybe from clinical inertia and just sort of put off referring when it's not, when it's just a little bit worse than the last time. So can you comment a little bit about the, about your opinion on the optimal timing of referral to nephrology in these kind of slow gradual cases? Sure, absolutely. And it's a wonderful point because, you know, even in our practice, we are, we are making a concerted effort to, to shorten our, our referral times, right? I mean, so, you know, we are busy and, and it's a double-edged sword. We, we, you know, absolutely don't want to make providers feel that, you know, they can't get patients in to see us. But at the same time, we want to prioritize, you know, who really needs to kind of get in with us now and who could potentially wait. In saying that, I would say there's absolutely not an inappropriate referral. Okay, you know, if 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 you if the primary care physician or provider truly feels that it's in the patient's interest to have them checked in with nephrology, please send the referral. You know, it may, if it's quote unquote too early and there's not much to do, at least maybe we have the conversation with the patient why their physician was concerned, what got their attention, you know, what we need to do and think about and regarding their kidneys, whether it's at, at the far reaches of, of kidney disease or not. But then I get referrals as well that I'm like, where were you five years ago? You know, I don't, I don't want a referral when the primary care physician feels that dialysis is imminent in the next three months, right? That, that's also, you know, not true. I would say what, what could help is an experience that I have is way more often than not when I ha have a patient, and this is the typical patient, 65, high blood pressure, diabetes, 30 plus years, you know, I have documented evidence that creatinine's been creeping, protein's been there, you know, they finally get referred to me because their, their provider um, reaches their personal threshold of, of when they feel a little more un uncomfortable and, and want a nephrologist involved, I ask the patient, you know, has anyone ever told you, you you've got some kidney disease or has anyone ever said your numbers are up or we're watching this? And, and more often than not, they say, no, no one's ever told me this is brand new, never happened. So at minimum, if, if providers could be a little more comfortable with at least, okay, we're going through your talking about your blood pressure and your diabetes, listen, just, I want you to let you know, I'm looking at your labs. I am seeing some evidence that, that, that your kidneys may be having some adverse effects because of that. Um, nothing to get excited about. Just want you to know I'm watching it. If it's, if it gets to a point where I think we could get a little more assistance, I, I may have to refer you to a nephrologist, at least, you know, that, that they know, right. That it's not brand new because on one hand, I, I'm often to, you know, defending the provider for, well, they never told me and I've never heard this. And I'm like, well, you know, they've been watching it, I promise, I promise they have. Or it's, it's you know, is it extreme? And we're, talk, we're talking of GFR less than 20 or 15 on the first referral. And I'm having very serious, heavy conversations with his patients about where we are. And they've never, they don't have a clue. And maybe they just didn't hear it or maybe it's how it was presented, but, you know, sometimes that's, that's difficult. So I would say, I mean, it's, it's, it's based on the provider. I would say if it is one of these typical slow creeps over time, it's a patient you've had for years or decades. And, you know, there's nothing that's really shifted to make you think that it's anything other than, you know, high blood pressure and diabetes. It's usually about a, a GFR 45 or so is, is a pretty typical one. I tell patient, you know, I've got this giant chart in my office that has the stages one, two, three, four, five, and it's in large print and multicolors. And I didn't make it, I don't like it, but you know, the patients usually have enough time to stare at it before I walk into the room. 
And then they, you know, they point, where am I? I'm like, well, you're kind of here in the middle of stage three. And I'm like, well, what, what happened to stage one and two? And I, I'm like, well, no one really gets referred till they're less than, their GFR less than 60. I was like, the labs don't even flag as abnormal until that point, you know, but just even some mild, or some small conversations of, from the provider early on, like you're high risk for kidney disease. I'm watching it very closely. We're okay, but you know, as things go on, just to, to even just mention it could be helpful. I think another thing that that you guys do really well that often gets might, might get left out in primary care is a really thorough medication review. You know, as sure. your GFR declines, you know, certain drugs need to be looked at and reassessed. Is this still sure. worth the allopurinol or you know something like that? So, and sometimes that kind of uh, reminder gets forgotten or, or jumped over. No, absolutely. You know, you're right. And, and I, and it goes both ways, right? So sometimes drugs are stopped because there's concern about kidney function and maybe that's, you know, maybe a misplaced concern and sometimes they're not stopped or not changed in the same way. And so, yeah, we spend a lot of time going through med lists and often, you know, you have these patients they are 20, 25 <laughs> meds on there. Um, and but definitely something that at least lends us a second set of eyes and a, and a second perspective for sure. Uh, ben, I have a, another thought. We, when we think about referrals to a subspecialist, in this case, the nephrologist, we almost always think of the primary care provider. But a lot of these patients are seeing other uh, providers, uh, including specialists, uh, cardiologists, right. surgeons, endocrinologists, right. and we can go a, a large list. How do we bring those individuals uh, and make them more aware, uh, again, of the importance of early referral in addition to the primary care provider? That's a fair question that I'm not sure I have an answer to. Um, you know, I would say endocrinologists are usually great, right? They're, um, it, it seems that kidney disease is very high on there. They tend to, in my experience, do a really good job of checking urines very frequently, especially looking for proteinuria. Uh, we know that as far as diabetic kidney disease goes, proteinuria is usually the first heralding marker that we're going to see, even if it's just a little bit. Very often I get referrals from endocrinologists with very small elevated proteins, but the first sight of it, they send them on, um, at least to get them in the loop. I don't think that they're going to do anything or think that I'm going to do anything magical to the, that they don't know, but at least just kind of get us in the fold. Cardiologists, you know, again, my experience can be different. Some are have a very short fuse to send a referral. Some send because, you know, they they feel like they need to do a heart cath and this they find this patient has a you know creatinine of two and a half or three. Um, and so they'll send it before, you know, send a referral before obviously they do anything. Now that's appropriate, but again, it's kind of well. This patient some, from somewhere probably should have been referred a bit before that. We live in an age where our electronic medical records are not fully synced, right? And, and in my part of the, of the country, I see patients from sometimes two hours away, right? And, and they're being followed by physicians I've never heard of, who've never heard of me. But to find a nephrologist, they have to, they have to travel to do so. You know, unfortunately, can be difficult. There's no... I wish there was a, a, you know, absolute recommended checklist to refer this, refer this, refer this, wait on this, wait on this, but it's, it's, it's experience and, and communication and just kind of having these conversations, unfortunately. You just kind of touched on something that I was going to ask about. So if it's okay, I'm going to sort of make this a two pronged question. And again, it's really kind of a follow-up to Dr. DePetty's point just now, can you share how best healthcare providers across really any specialty can better their collaboration with you as a nephrologist to provide the greatest benefit to the patients? And kind of the second part of that would be, in your experience and opinion, what do you see as the most commonly encountered barriers and challenges that can lead to a delay in a timely referral? And kind of to your point, you know, you just mentioned that travel and the syncing of health records could probably lead into that a great deal. But are there any other um, insights you would like to, to share with us? Yeah, I mean, I would say 
communication and, and I'm not the best at it all the time. And I, you know, it's cause we see a lot of patients and we're busy and, you know, I, I don't always have the personal numbers to, to reach back out to providers. Um, obviously, you know, I, I try to make sure that at least my, my initial encounter notes are well dictated, that there's a, flow, a thought process, a flow. There's no question of what I'm thinking or what I think is going on. Um, and, I, and I try to make sure that my office gets those back to the, to the referring physician. If, if, you know, obviously if there are times where I need more information or I really want to, I'm like, I have a question of what, what is your primary concern and what are you really concerned about? And let me tell you what I'm thinking. And, and we may need, need to get on this quickly or follow up for sure. I'll try to track down that, that physician's office and, and get a person, you know, try to tell their office, I need to speak to them person. Here's my cell phone. Call me, you know, let's talk about this patient. If, pay, if physicians reach out to me, I always obviously try to be available and, and talk specifically about that patient. That seems to work the best. So there, there is no, you know, there, there is nothing lost in translation between, I saw a patient, I have a thought, I think I need to see a nephrologist. The nephrologist sees them, he has a thought, I'm going to send it back electronically. There's no direct communication. And sometimes like, well, I wasn't even worried about that. You know, that's not even what I wanted you to see the patient for. And I'm like, oh, well. so to answer your question, no, there's not a, I mean, the best way to do it is get on the phone. Uh, is that always the easiest and most logical and, you know, timely way to do it? Not always, but that, that's on all of us to try to be better, I think. Thank you. Dr. DePetty or Dr. Edwards, do you have any? follow-up questions or comments regarding that? Jennifer, I think I have a, a comment and, and maybe it is a, it turns into a question. Then one of the most common, I guess, uh, barriers that I hear, again, most, again, from primary care providers, but it could be all providers, including subspecialty providers, is that the nephrologists, uh, as other specialists, they're really, really busy. And what I hear is, is that maybe they only want to see the more severe cases but they don't have time or maybe they're not as interesting or the patient isn't as challenging, uh, you know, earlier on. How do, we how do we dispel that? You mentioned uh, that you obviously want earlier referrals in the natural history of any of the, the, the renal disease states, but how do we overcome that barrier? Yeah, um, that's heavy. Unfortunately, <laughs> <can only> speak. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, nephrology is as a specialty is on the decline. The last five to 10 years now, I don't quote me on this, but 50% of the fellowship programs are not even full, you know, yeah. and it's only getting worse. I'm fortunate personally to live and work in, in a part of the world and in, in the state of Alabama and Birmingham specifically, that's a large medical hub. We've got a large practice, you know, people can get to us. We can work you in. Uh, we want to see you. But as I said, we also see patients from far out rural parts. It's, it's not reasonable for them to be able to make the travel or have the transportation or pay for the gas or what have you. You know, I, we do not want to see patients at the end of their rope for sure. OK, <laughs> if, if there's any question that, you know, is this a little earlier? Is there some stuff that, you know, you can give me some tips or recommendations that I can do and follow or while I have them and, and maybe wait, put off a referral by six or 12 months and, you know, making sure that I'm watching what you would be watching, you know, hopefully that can be done with, with a phone call. You know, uh, again, I want to stress that even though with, in, in full disclosure, sometimes I'll be flipping through a new patient record and before I walk in the door, I'm like, are we not screening these? I mean, this is not urgent. You know, that we're wasting the patient's time and energy. You know, what, what do they want me to do about this? It's not that bad. But at the same time, our, our job as specialists is to be there and to support the, the primary physicians or whoever the referring physician may be. And so that's why it's, there's never an inappropriate referral. A phone call, a very quick phone call could probably save everyone a lot of time and effort and, and energy. A couple of simple questions or, you know, I could recommend yeah well they they've got high blood pressure and diabetes i would assume much like you probably are that that's what what's causing this decline in their renal function it seems you're what you're monitoring it appropriately enough 
it seems that you have them on the right medicines. I, I'm not hearing you say anything that's got my radars up and, and I would continue to watch for this, this, and this. And if any of these things change significantly, send them on. If they're staying pretty stable and you feel fairly comfortable, it's probably well within your, your ability to continue to monitor them. Again, let them know that you are. Mention that you're, that you're seeing this. Don't, and, and sometimes the patient's like, well, I want to see a specialist. And, and of course, at that time, if, if they ever say, you know, I want to, send them on. And, and they want to hear it from the horse's mouth or another point of view, so be it. But so then what I, what I think I'm hearing is, is that from the, from the referring uh, provider, uh, if you will, from their standpoint, when in doubt about a referral, number one, call. And then maybe number two is, again, when in doubt and you don't want to call or you're reticent to call or you can't connect, refer the patient. I, I mean, it's, there's never, yeah, I, I guess that is what, I, what I'm saying. But then I would also, you know, encourage the, the referring physician to make sure that they've taken a second to really think about this, yeah. okay? But, so let's take, let's take the patient who is there for yearly checkup and maybe a refill on their cholesterol medicine or something, or, you know, they don't have a whole laundry list of medical issues. They definitely don't have anything that puts them at high risk for expected kidney disease. And suddenly they, they look at a lab that um, is pretty grossly abnormal for, for someone who fits in that box. I wouldn't need jerk make the react the referral then. You know there are some things that can be done. You can sometimes you just catch patients on a bad day, right? Sometimes they're dry. I don't know. We can't explain it. So I would repeat the test, bring them back in, make sure you're you know go through the common things, double check their medications. Are they started taking anything else? Have they been on any antibiotics? Back to them specifically. You know, um, are they a man of age where they're having in large prostate issues, is there concern that there may be some, some bladder outlet obstruction that has driven this to some degree? You know, you can, if, if available, get an ultrasound, make sure you're checking their urine and, you know, do these, these kind of simple workups that, that I think should be available to, to anyone and, and see if you can kind of get a little bit of a sense of, of why it is. If, if any of that is concerning or you feel like you've ruled out the most common things and, and you've repeated labs and they're not better and by all means, send them on. You know, I, I've had some referrals recently. I actually the guy who redid my, my AC unit. Um, <laughs> I called him after referral after he told me what he did, but he, uh, you know, he's in his forties and he's like, I know what happened. He's like, I'm in the hundred degree attic. I'm not drinking anything. I'm it's hot. It's hundred <laughs> degrees, you know? And, and I did, I repeated his, he, he, Happened to catch his primary care physician one week as on a routine yearly check. Creatinine was up. Referral got made. He came to me. He's like, I, was, I just drank more. I repeated it completely normal. You know, I told him he didn't need to see me again, except here's my address and I need my AC unit <laughs> done. But, but you know, it's, it's, it's kind of those sorts of things. You know, there are common things being common. Rule out the common things. And, but, you know, and make sure that you, you, really, you know, you really have a question. I mean, make sure you really have some doubt as to what's going on and you're concerned um, that you're missing something. This has been wonderful. And before we conclude and recognizing that we are going to discuss in greater detail a lot of the conditions that we've touched upon today, are there any final general thoughts or pearls of wisdom you would like to share with our listeners? I would say that I feel, and I may, I, I may be wrong in this, um, but I, I know that, you know, you could ask any, any healthcare provider at any stage of their training, if any specific field makes them feel uncomfortable or may, they just don't feel they have a full grasp on, I certainly have those, okay? Um, I feel that a lot of people would say nephrology for whatever reason. I may be wrong in that assumption, but I feel that some people just feel really nervous when the kidneys start to get involved. You know, I, any wisdom, and it's taken me seven years into out of fellowship and in a private practice to feel mostly comfortable, that that's okay. And that's understandable, you know, it, but it shouldn't be feared, right? I mean, it, it's okay. Uh, you know, there's usually a reason why a patient's labs look abnormal or, or, or why, 
their kidney function is, is declining either slowly or quickly or anywhere in between. It's, uh, part of it's up to me sometimes to really figure out what that reason is, but there's not oftentimes, there shouldn't be a lot of uh, true panic involved, okay? Those, those scary diagnoses that you, you hear about and you're tested about and they come up on boards all the time, yeah, they happen and we see them. Uh, but they are very, very few and far between, honestly. And it's it, more often than not, there there's some common and often reversible or treatable issues related to, to kidney disease. And and so I wouldn't uh, I would I would guess I would encourage people not to panic too bad. We hope you enjoyed the practice of medicine. For more episodes in this series or SMA's The Business of Medicine podcast, go to sma.org slash podcasts or subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. For more information about SMA's physicians and training, please visit sma.org slash pit. And thank you for joining us.